Hey, it's Rob here in Crazy Town, bringing you some bonus material while we're in between seasons. This is an in-depth interview that a share conducted with Sherry Mitchell on the long history of colonization and conquest, and the opportunities we now have to decolonize our society, our minds, and our hearts. Sherry is a lawyer, educator, writer, speaker, and organizer who has been involved with indigenous rights and environmental justice work for more than 25 years. Now, the interview. Sherry, thank you so much for taking the time. We're on the opposite ends of this continent here, right? I'm in, I'm in Oregon, you're in Maine. I guess with the magic of technology, this is as close as we can get to each other. Even if we're in the same town, I guess we couldn't be right next to each other in any case. But it's good to see you again, even if it's virtual. Last time I saw you was over a year ago when we were in upstate New York. We spent a few days together talking about the prospects of a great unraveling. And here we are, right? Talking about the prospects of what we're living right right now. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny, we didn't predict this, right? But we were talking about all these different issues and crises kind of coming together and, and the possibility of things unraveling. And uh, yeah, what a strange moment to find ourselves in now. How yeah. are you coping with all that? You know, I, I've talked to, I talked to Tim, to Christopher, who was with us during that time. And I've also talked to Vicki Robin. Mm-hmm. And um, one of the things that I just, it just strikes me is that it was almost exactly a year. Um, yeah when we were together talking about potential scenarios for collapse within our society, uh, economic, you know, uh, climate, other forms of natural disasters and crises. And, um, you know, we didn't, we didn't outline this specific crises, Mm -hmm. but, but um, we were having the discussion about where do we need to be moving in order to be best situated for any type of crises. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, I had been really working toward the goals that, that I established for myself during our time together over the past year. And, and now here we are Yeah. You know, in this moment of, yeah. um, you know, really having to look at, our reliance on failing systems and our lack of connectivity to the sources of our survival. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. And I really wanted to, to talk with you, I think specifically sort of in the context of what we've been seeing over the last few months mm-hmm. around, I think some people recognizing the a bit of the systemic and structural drivers of you know uh of inequality and uh being in wrong relationship with one another i think there's been less of an emphasis and focus on wrong relationship with nature i think we've been so consumed in terms of thinking about um the impacts on humans right now with the with the pandemic but then i think you know Seeing people, and this is a good thing, I think seeing people recognize now this whole idea of essential workers, people that, you know, our economy has taken for granted um, and is still largely taking for granted now, but is recognizing our dependence upon them. And uh, and then also, I think, obviously, with um, the the protests that we've been seeing around, you know, police violence uh, particularly aimed at Afri- African Americans and the history behind that, and I think some folks recognizing white privilege and starting to think about this sort of the systemic uh, injustices and racism built into the system. I really wanted to talk to you about what feels to me like the deeper root causes of that, you know. Okay. And and when we were together, we we talked a bit about sort of the, the colonization and the colonial mindset and the, the the process of what you were calling decolonizing the mind. And so I thought maybe it'd be useful f- for you to at least just start with defining, defining those terms. What does that even mean? Why is that relevant uh, to people, especially in this moment? Yeah, I think that, you know, the, 
the thing about colonization is that, uh, and you know, the work around decolonization is that it often gets confused with anti-oppression work so that people don't really know what colonization is. And so I think that, you know, looking at the distinction between um, colonization and oppression, um, you know, when we're talking about colonization, it really is uh, the relationship that exists between settler um, colonialism and indigenous populations. And mm -hmm. so um, the, the word colonization actually comes from this Latin word, um, colonus, uh, which, which meant um, farmer or tiller of the soil. And it's, it's really morphed into this um, destroyer of the soil uh, based on this, this terminology of terra nullius. Uh, you know, uh, one of the things that, um, that colonization is, is really rooted in is this idea that the land in and of itself has no value. Mm -hmm. uh, this lofty in theory of land, if it's not being put to some beneficial use, and that beneficial use is tied to um, profitability and capitalism. And so uh, when, when people came here to this continent, when we're talking about colonization of the Americas, colonization of Turtle Island or North America, um, you know, we're talking about the fact that the founders viewed this land in terms of terra nullis. Um, and there's this Ben Franklin quote where he says that, you know, the Indian people that were here, the indigenous peoples that were here were just a sketch in red crayon uh, placeholders in history, uh, waiting for the true lords of the land to arrive, meaning the European colonizers. And so even though, uh, you know, we were here since time immemorial, um, our, our people, my particular tribe, we um, have our, our roots deep in this land. We can trace our lineage back to the place where we currently still reside more than 15,000 years. Um, but as far as the colonizers were concerned, um, you know, we, we didn't exist because we didn't exist within their framework. And so it's this very narrow um, myopic view of, of the world and, and what, it, what it offers um, to those who see it through the colonial lens. And so when we're, when we're talking about um, colonization, it's about settling an area that's previously unoccupied by others. Um, but, you know, uh, in truth, it's settling among and establishing control over indigenous peoples and their lands and their waterways, their ways of life. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's called settling, but it's very unsettling. It comes in and it's, it's like this cultural bomb that just destroys the uh, existing peoples of that place and tries to impose the value systems of the colonizer upon those people and uh, strip away all of their diversity and um, their uh, cultural identity and to try to homogenize them into the, the um, way of being and way of thinking and um, of the colonizer, which is, is very destructive in, in terms of just um, having healthy systems, right? Like if we think about the natural world, we have incredible biodiversity, which keeps our ecosystems healthy and thriving, right? It's, it's, it's a measure of the richness of the biodiversity within that ecosystem. It's the same thing within our bodies. We have all of these systems and structures that work in harmony with one another in order to keep us fully functioning and healthy. And so why do we think within our societies that homogenization or acculturation assimilation is healthy for society. Uh, that's what colonization does is it strips away all of that diversity and imposes a value structure that's based in dominance, oppression, uh, genocide, slavery, all of the worst behaviors um, that humanity has expressed throughout history. And so, um, you know, colonization is, is really in, in, in my opinion, a sickness of the mind. It's a sickness of the art. And so, um, you know, it's something that everyone has a vested interest in rooting out. Now, you, um, you talked about sort of the Lockean view of land, right? Is it being worthless unless it's being, you know, put to quote unquote productive economic use? Right. Um, and you talked a little bit about the exploitation or the eradication of indigenous peoples. I, I remember you, you uh, when we were together, you talked about the history of this sort of going back 
this is before kind of, um, you know, uh, you know, British colonizers, you know, coming to, to the United States, what became the United States, right? You, you, you talked about the people bowls that were, maybe you could talk a little bit about that sort of that history and, and the view of land and people, yeah. you know, uh, that were in kind of the, the quote unquote new world. Yeah. I, I think it's really important to recognize that, um, especially for people of European descent who kind of like get really defensive and balk against this talk of decolonization and structural racism and systems of oppression um, because there's there they have a hard time separating themselves from those systems, those structures, the benefits, the privileges um, that have accompanied the movement of that mental and spiritual illness across time. Uh, but the, the European uh, people were colonized before we were colonized. And so um, you think about the Inquisition. Uh, it was, you know, they, they were drowning and burning their own women before they came to our lands and began doing that here. Um, and uh, they were enslaving people long before they came here. And so if we go back to the very beginning, like before Common Era, 3000 BCE, um, uh, the first commodity that entered into the exchange market was the body of a woman in exchange for land. Um, in the uh, arranged marriages between families um, for the preservation of, of control over the land, the woman's body became the first um, product in that exchange market. And so then we move from there into slavery and uh, those papal bulls uh, related to strict to slavery and that are now incorporated into U S law under the Marshall trilogy um, are these three particular papal bulls that are known as the doctrines of discovery. And what they were, they were the Christian law of nations. They were three papal bulls um, that were put forth by uh, Alexander the fourth and Nicholas the fourth. And the first one, um, Nicholas was uh, um, dumb diversus. And in that one, it um, created the slave trade all the way from Cape Bojada all the way to the West, um, through the West Coast of Africa and split the hemispheres of the, of the globe um, and gave half to Spain and half to Portugal to control, to enslave people, to um, seek out and vanquish what they called enemies of Christ. So anyone who didn't belong to the Roman Catholic Church, they'd step out of their boat, they'd unroll their scroll, they'd read an edict, and if the person didn't respond uh, in the manner that they thought they should, you know, uh, no consideration given for language barriers, then they uh, they were given permission by the Pope to slaughter them, to take all of their possessions, to put them into perpetual slavery. I mean, these are actual documents that, that you can trace the history of. Um, and then uh, Romanus Pontifex um, was another one of those three papal bulls. And the final one, Inches of Terror, was the one that Christopher Columbus was operating on when he returned to the Americas to claim it uh, on behalf of the Church of Rome. And so the one of the first acts that the United States Supreme Court um, engaged in shortly after the... It was, 35 years after the ratification of the Constitution of the United States, where the first uh, amendment to the Constitution of the United States is the Establishment Clause, that there shall be no, um, you know, favoring of the establishment of any religion within the laws of the United States. And uh, what the United States did uh, in the United States Supreme Court was they used the Christian law of nations and the doctrines of discovery in those papal bulls as the legal basis for dispossessing indigenous peoples of their lands, um, claiming that the United States was a successor in interest to those, to those lands uh, based on the laws of conquest outlined in those papal bulls from the Roman Catholic Church. And so they violated their constitution in the very first act mm -hmm. that they engaged in, uh, in relation to indigenous peoples on this, on this continent. And so uh, when you think about that being the basis for the history of laws that allows the United States to maintain control over this land base um, and understand that that goes back to the 1400s and was recently cited as, as late as 2011 uh, by the United States Supreme Court because it's still standing law. Mm -hmm. uh, it boggles the mind, but it also helps us understand the deep grasp 
that these colonial histories continue to have on the ways that we engage with one another um, functionally within the society. Right. I mean, you're talking about legally. Right. It's also, I think, just mindset. And and uh, something I've been thinking a lot about is there's a reckoning maybe happening here a, a bit with our history, right? Right now in the United States and, you know, debates over statues, you know, and, and, and how it seems to be stretching beyond just taking down Confederate leaders, you know, to now changing the names of schools named after Woodrow Wilson and, you know, even questions about, you know, George Washington, you know, our, you know, founding president and, and all that. Um, I think grappling with that history is a really important thing. I, I do wonder how systemic we are in thinking about it, how deep we're going, you know, because, um, and again, this I think comes back to maybe a difference between the colonial mindset and if you want to compare it to something like the indigenous mindset, uh, there's the exploitation of people like you talked about and the exploitation of land. And those are very closely tied together, right? It And it's, it's in the interest of the pursuit of individual happiness or profit or whatever. It's again, it's putting the individual first right. and seeing everything and everyone as an instrument of that economic, you know, priority, right? Which is everyone pursuing their own self-interest in a free market or something like that, or their, you know, what they, what they're able to do with their property. And that feels like a real big part of this sickness too. And why we're here, not just with this kind of grappling with our racist past and trying to deal with the fact that we have an economic system that's really unequal, but also, even though a lot of people are maybe not thinking about the environmental crisis that we're in right now, those are all connected. Well, I mean, yeah, they're absolutely connected. And, you know, I think that one of the, one of the things that's difficult for people to really contemplate the depth of influence that these systems have on us, uh, you know, that there, there's really three major areas where colonization is completely infiltrated into the governing systems and structures within our societies. Uh, we talked about, you know, law and politics, right? We talked about, you know, Ben Franklin's view of indigenous people. Uh, ben Franklin is revered as being one of the greatest uh, men um, the world has ever known, right? Um, also religion, papal bulls um, tied into the law and politics. And then we get into education and, um, you know, the educational system was actually structured um, to uplift and support these systems and structures that had such an incredibly um, inequitable, biased, singular point of view that um, in order to be able to correct our course, we're going to have to really get into that, Mm -hmm. dismantling um, all of the systems and structures, primarily looking at those three, um, looking at how, uh, you know, religion has influenced the minds of people. Um, what is it within, you know, and I, we've talked about this. I, I do, uh, you know, I could easily teach an entire semester on decolonization. Mm-hmm. And I, I do often teach decolonization in every course that I teach uh, at the university level. But I also do a series of teachings on decolonization. And so we can't get into the entire process of of that work uh decolonization anti-oppression anti-racism work in in that short period of time that we're going to be together um but you know we really have to look at dismantling structures that perpetuate the status quo and when we think about the importance of representation and symbolism um being able to take down these symbols uh these representations of the history of dominance and oppression and genocide and slavery, inequity that have plagued this country. Uh, They have been a plague upon this country uh, since its founding, you know, and and you can't correct something that was um, started so wrong. There has to be a complete dismantling and a complete rebuilding. 
you know, maybe there are some some uh, of the some of the wood can be salvaged, right? Um, mm -hmm. But the entire structure has to be taken down. And so, people who who believe that we can fix from the inside the system, the system's not broken. The system is doing exactly what it was designed to do. It was designed to maintain the status quo um, state of inequity and superiority for a very small demographic of, of the population that is rapidly disappearing. And so, um, you know, there's, there's all kinds of things that are going on. The complexity, um, not just socially, not just in regard to justice, not just uh, related to the evolution of our consciousness, but on every level across the board is being called uh, into question right now. It's requiring our attention. Um, and our nuanced attention, not just, you know, oh yeah, you know, I say this is happening, but we have to be really nuanced about how we're handling it, uh, and not just, just come in and, and become, um, conquistadors ourselves. Right? Yeah. I want to, I want to actually probe that a little bit because I'd be curious to know your opinion on this. So on the one hand, the symbols of oppression and uh, and taking those down can be a powerful step. On the other hand, how do we how do we address those things? How do we you know take down the structures of oppression and build something anew without having having? How do we do that in a way where we're having this nuanced recognition and a real internalization of this? So you know, one of the things I guess I worry about is. Um, simply taking down statues, let's say, yeah. or, or shutting down opinions and perspectives that maybe are ignorant mm -hmm. uh, and saying that's wrong. Do you know what I mean? Does that, how does that allow us to kind of really reckon and grapple with, with this history and go through a more deep transformation? You know, I just, I think that there are, um, we have been conditioned to be competitive and to be cutthroat. Uh, we have been conditioned to, to believe that the way to solve a problem is by conquering the problem. Mm -hmm. um, so conquest has been the modus operandi for 17 plus centuries. Um, and so when we're thinking about how do we solve the problems that, you know, uh, we'll say, we'll say two millennia. We know it's been longer than that, right? How do we solve the problems of, of two millennia that have compounded upon um, one another and built to the current reality that we're inhabiting together? Um, that can't be done in a sound bite. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, the other thing to think about in regard to that is that we have um, people at various levels of consciousness who are coming to this uh, awakening, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some of us who are, are um, you know, we're tired. Uh, we have been awake for a very, very long time. And, um, and then there are those who are just waking up. I was, I was asked to do, you know, I'm, I'm an Indigenous rights attorney, and I've been doing this uh, Indigenous justice work for about 30 years at this point. Um, and I had a young person jump in to uh, a discussion that I was invited to give um, on this particular platform, uh, trying to inform me of all of the things that I've been actively working on for 30 years because they didn't take the time to, to check into who I was, mm -hmm. what my history might be. And so you have this, like, um, this exuberance amongst those who are just waking up, um, and you have... Uh, the whole uh, Extinction Rebellion thing, that's not just a group, it's actually a, a very real uh, resonant thing within our bodies, right? Um, and you have um, this really toxic, bullying, um, exclusive, exclusionary um, cultural paradigm that we're trying to move out of. Uh, mm -hmm. And as we're trying to move out of that, Many people are using the very same um, tools, the very same ways of being that created the problem that we're in. Hmm. And so when we're talking about cancel culture, 
we're talking about conquest, right? Mm. Uh, when we're talking about um, a lot of things that are that are being done that that are kind of counterproductive to where we want to go, um, and that are actually just a perpetuation, a new face. Because uh, colonization, we're supposed to be living in a post-colonial era. Absolutely untrue. Colonization mm. is alive and well; it's thriving. And so, um, when we think about that, it it just changes names changes shapes, changes faces. Uh, and so when we're thinking about where do we want to go in the future, we really have to be willing to do the work to call ourselves out um, and to call those in, others in who, um, who we're engaged in battles of conquest with. Uh, mm-hmm. Otherwise, we're just perpetuating the cycle. And we're doing what everybody before us in history has done, which is to perpetuate a cycle because we think we're the good guys and they're the bad guys. They think they're the good guys and we're the bad guys. And so if we're going to just keep perpetuating these cycles of conquest, we're not going to get anywhere. Uh, And so, you know, we really need to look at that because, uh, you know, the most powerful thing that was ever said is, uh, you know, that you can't use the master's tools to dismantle the master's house. And so when we're thinking about colonization, we can't use the practices of domination and colonization, conquest and genocide. Uh, to eliminate those things from our society. We just can't. You can't use those things, um, whether literally, figuratively, you know, uh, theoretically, and expect to have a different result. We just, we have to be better. We have to be better. We have to be willing to do the work, which is really hard. It's much easier to come in with a wrecking ball than it is, uh, you know, to come in with some delicate tools to really look at uh, how do we dismantle this without crushing people in the process. Mm-hmm. Uh, how do we how do we recognize that um, that there is no acceptable collateral damage when it comes to life? Life is sacred, and uh, you know, really shifting the way that that we're that we're thinking because we're we're still thinking in regard to uh, a colonized mindset when we're addressing some of the problems that we're facing today. So, so what does it mean then? I mean, this feels like such a big a big, such an enormous kind of amorphous challenge to think about if you, if we recognize that we effectively are, it's like, you know, the, the whole metaphor of the fish in water, you know, if, if, if we've been swimming in these waters mm-hmm. and for, for so long, so many generations that we're not even aware that there's a different way of thinking, how do we, how do we do that? Is that turning towards, um, towards other humans who think differently, learning from other species that think differently. What, what does that, what does that even look like? I, I, I think that one of the things I did this um, class over the weekend for um, next gen um, and looking at uh, this moment that we're in right now and what this moment is, is, this is uh, this is a big um, this is a big test for us, right? Uh, and people think, oh, it's a test of our patience, it's a test of our perseverance, it's a test of you know uh, our intelligence in, in regard to intellect or emotional intelligence. Uh, this is a test of our conscious evolution right now. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so what we're what we're actually having the opportunity to do because everyone feels really isolated. Uh, But if you take five minutes at the beginning of anything that you do and you tell the people, let's just close our eyes for a minute and let's just reach out energetically or spiritually or whatever and connect with a person that we're going to be having conversation with, you actually can feel them. You can feel them enter the room that you're in, right? And so what the test is, this is a test for us to realize that this whole notion of separation is an illusion. Mm -hmm. And that everything that we have created out of that illusion of separation has been destructive to life. It's been destructive to human beings. It's been destructive to societies. It's been destructive to the environment, to uh, countless other species. We have a million species uh, facing extinction right now as a result of human behavior, largely. And so, um, and human behavior that's been driven by this belief in separation. And so we have to really go, go back. I mean, and that's the thing that seems kind of counterintuitive is that when we're thinking about dealing with colonization, we're like, we want to move forward. We want to move forward. 
Um, but we have to actually go back to look at how all these systems and structures were created. What is, what's the underlying ideology? How have we been conditioned uh, to behave in certain ways by that ideology and by the presence of violence if we failed to uh, you know, adhere to the strictures of the day, right? That's all conditioned behavior that happened over, over millennia. Uh, how have we been entrained to uh, behave towards one another to engage in certain ways of being in relationship to one another um, throughout the course of history. Uh, but also looking at this history of emotion, how have emotions been utilized to shame people, to create fear in people, to create hatred in people, that whole dehumanization piece that's connected to warfare. I mean, we have to be willing to really go deep into those types of things um, in order to be able to really address what's going on here. and. Um, we can't be using this cancel culture that's really part of the meanness culture of our past. It's part of the oppression. It's part of the conquest that we're trying to come out of uh, in order to get somewhere else because it's not going to get us there. It just won't, it just won't do it. And so, you know, as we're moving through um, this process, we have to begin with ourselves. We have to really be willing to look at how am I doing this personally? Right. Um, and then what we need to do is to not necessarily say, I'm going to throw all my seed on rocky ground. I'm going to try to convince my one neighbor who I know is racist and uh, thinks that any kind of kindness toward another human being is socialism. I'm going to try to convert them to my way of thinking. Just a different form of conquest, first of all, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but also um, what we need to do in order to build momentum, to be able to really move the entire ship forward, is to look for interest convergence points. Um, so uh, Derek Bell, who is a preeminent civil rights scholar um, during the civil rights movement, said that, you know, power concedes nothing without some beneficial interest to themselves. Mm-hmm. And so those in positions of power don't concede that power unless there's some benefit to that, uh, to them for conceding power. Um, and right now people are really pushing like, well, if you want to stay alive, we, you know, it's in your benefit to move the way that we want you to, because we're going to use force, right? Again, that's conquest. It's, it's the same kind of energy, the same kind of mentality and ideology that led us to this place in the first place. So can you find one thing that you agree with this neighbor on? Can you find one thing um, that you agree with somebody who is, seems diametrically opposed to you? And can you build on that one thing and say, okay, we both agree that uh, it would be really beneficial if we had food security in our, in our town for all of those people who are shut in right now? Uh, can we agree that um, we need to figure out a way for people to be getting some fresh air uh, uh, in a way that doesn't create risk to other people's well-being? Uh, can we agree on something? Is there anything we can agree on? Uh, can we agree that we want you know, our, our local farmers to be lifted up in some way that ensures that, that we're able to do, uh, you know, get what we need personally? There's something you just have to look and you have to work to figure out what that, what that something is, but there's always something that you can agree on and that you can begin to build relationship on. Um, because that, that's really the key. This is really about what we call, um, you know, uh, in Dilna Bamak. And in my book, I talk about this in, in regard to the core value section, um, of, of looking at all of life in regard to relationships uh, everything is about relationship. What is my relationship with myself? What is my relationship with you? What is my relationship with the earth? Uh, we're in this situation because of the way that we have developed relationships with one another and with the earth. Um, from our tradition, our history here in uh, Chkobanakia territory, our, what our story, mythology, hundreds of years old, this story um, of the first illness is that human beings fell out of alignment with life. Essentially, this is the Reader's Digest version of the, of the story. Uh, human beings essentially fell out of alignment with life, and the animals gave them illness to remind them of their interconnectivity with the rest of life. And, you know, so we have this story that's hundreds of years old that's been passed down through oral tradition that, you know, my great-grandmother told my grandmother, who then told me, um, and then I tell my children, um, this story that actually defines 
the exact scenario that we are living in right now, where we are in a situation where human beings who fell out of alignment with the rest of the natural world created this destruction and the animals gave us illness. Uh, and now we're, we're being forced to sit and to think about what is our interconnectedness with the rest of life? Um, you know, how can we uh, make connections in ways that are different from the ways that we've been connecting in the past? Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, you know, that, that may be more destructive to life, including the lives of those that we love. Um, and so there's just, there's a lot of really fertile soil right now for a lot of this work. And so um, when we try to separate it out into little individual siloed pieces, we end up always coming back to the understanding that it's all interconnected mm-hmm. and, and that we can't really deal with any one piece without it affecting the whole um, or without an understanding of the whole. We can't really start thinking about disconnected solutions um, because they're not going to be effective. Yeah. So it seems like a lot of this work is internal work, right? It's, I think, recognizing uh, how we are separated from one another and from nature Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe trying to put that into practice differently. And I guess that that does include the things, I mean, you talk about uh, illness being nature's way of bringing us back into into connection and recognizing our, our connectivity. It's really hard to do that. I mean, talk about this sort of colonial conquering mindset, right? Our whole thing right now is to defeat this virus, right? right? right. Um, we have a war against this virus. This virus is attacking us. Right. Um, it's really hard to say, no, we need to embrace and welcome and see the value of a virus that's actually threatening the lives of, and has taken the lives of, of many people. Um, it's the same as, as dealing with colonization, right? It's, right? it's the same thing. We have to go back to look at the root cause mm-hmm. and we have to start working with that root cause and then bring ourselves forward. Right. Because yeah. if we don't, the, this is, this is going to be child's play compared to what's coming next. If right. we don't get it together. Right. Yeah. And so one of the tricks of that whole colonization of the mind is that, it just, it causes us to doubt ourselves, right? It causes us to believe that there is no other way to live um, other than the way that has been like um, uplifted by the colonizer, promoted mm-hmm. by the colonizer. It's too deeply entrenched. We can't change it. Um, that, that part of that, um, the virus of colonization uh, and, and the virus of capitalism, those things are deeply connected. Mm -hmm. Um, We have uh, systems, a whole entire economic system that is based on on principles of exchange. And uh, when you have principles of exchange, there's always going to be one side that is more benefited than the other. Uh, There are always going to be those who are power brokers. And so how do we shift that whole value system so that we're not thinking about things in regard to an exchange economy? Um, that we're thinking about things in, in regard to like these matrilineal, matricultural ways of being that are uh, germane to my people, um, that a friend of mine who um, has really studied matriarchy and matrilineal ways of being for decades, um, this beautiful woman named Genevieve Vaughn, who's written extensively on the, um, the maternal roots of the gift economy. And so um, looking at how this matrilineal way of being where the, this uh, woman centered societies, um, everybody was taken care of in an equitable way uh, because everybody was treated as kin and um, operating from, from our perspective, we come from uh, matricultural ways to be where the, it's a, it's a mother and grandmother focused center to our communities looking at uh, how can we make sure that everyone has enough? How can we make sure that uh, life is preserved? This whole principle of like counting coup on a, a, an enemy um, was the whole purpose of that was to get close enough to them where you could actually take their life and, and leaving a a trinket or taking something of theirs um, to let them know I was close enough to take your life but I valued your life and the sacredness of your life enough not to do that. And now I'm asking you to value the sacredness of my life. Hmm. Um, You know, just understanding that there are different ways of being um, and different ways 
of, of um, communicating with one another. There are uh, different ways to think about the structure of value, how we assign value, because we've, we've broken down and commodified ourselves into individual saleable pieces as well, to the point where we don't know who we are anymore. Um, there is an absolute- We're consumers, like, right? That's our job. We're consumers. We're either, we're either, uh, we're either consumers or we're commodities, mm -hmm. right? We're one of two things. And so um, the joke that I always tell in my, in my um, trainings, which is, is uh, you know, we have to laugh or we'll cry because of the truth of it is if we think about, if we want to understand the depth of the mindset, um, when somebody is single in our society, people say that they're on the market. Right. And so we're selling even our most intimate, most important and critical relationships, um, or we're looking at them as being saleable. And mm -hmm. so when we think about the way that we assign value, um, if, if we truly believe that everyone is born with a unique gift that is um, specifically attuned to the time that they're born into, uh, and we think about the ways that we commodify ourselves and the ways that we uh, break ourselves up into saleable pieces, how do we ever emerge as fully embodied beings capable of sharing whatever unique gift we have with the world if we can't be whole because we're broken down into saleable commodified pieces? And so there's, there's just so much that needs to be unwrapped here. Um, and that's, that's how I've been spending a lot of my time uh, while we've been in quarantine is having discussions on specific aspects of that. And how do we unpack that? How do we begin moving ourselves um, into a place where we can come out of this as whole beings, where we can come out as uh, really powerfully creative uh, uh, thinkers where, where we're capable of reimagining our ways of being in the world so that we can collectively co-create the type of world that we want to live in. Um, I was at this environmental conference where um, I was invited to speak uh, several years ago and, and there was a woman there and I can't remember her name, um, but the most powerful thing that I heard that day, and there were a lot of amazing amazing presentations was this one question that this woman asked the audience. Why are we collectively building a world that none of us would individually want to live in? Like we would never individually choose to have the world be in the state that it is right now, but collectively this is what we're creating. Mm -hmm. Why are we doing that when we have the collective power to co-create a completely different reality, a completely different way of being uh, mm -hmm. in the world and in relationship with one another and the rest of life. Mm -hmm. That's the question we should be asking ourselves right now while we have this time to reflect is, you know, why are we doing that? We don't have, recognizing we don't have to do it. And then thinking about how can we collectively co-create something new that we're ready to actually walk into being when we, are ready to, to come out of this, which I think is going to be at least another year. Yeah. I, mean, I, I really like thinking this is a, as a, a moment to, to reflect. It's a, uh, I mean, so much of our work uh, at post carbon Institute and conversations we have like, like this one are around recognizing nuance and in understanding not only the interconnections between things, but, but recognizing that there are no simple solutions to them. And, yeah. uh, and we have this, I think for, for a lot of people who do want to, they are trying to, uh, to write injustices, right wrongs and to try to build a better future. Uh, there's this moment of opportunity it feels like here and a kind of a quickening, uh, you know, we, we certainly see people practicing kind of the disaster capitalism, you know, uh, yeah. you know, power grab, you know, profit pandemic grab. Profiteers, my friend Chuck Collins, you know, Chuck yeah. calls it uh, pandemic profiteering. Right. And we're seeing that, you know, Absolutely. and I think on the, on the other side, I think people with maybe more progressive values or, or uh, social values, are also trying to figure out how do we seize this moment. And, and, you, and you can look and you say, 
there there are really amazing things that are happening that sort of seemed you know improbable before right the 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 idea of really challenging the po- the police state you know and and how some cities are actually you know changing policy as a result of that but i think what you're saying or what i'm hearing is that we can't be using the same tools yeah. you know that created the system that we're trying to take down and so when we're rushing to, sort of to do that and and step into this moment to be doing it um with a mindset of conquering and attacking and just destroying, you know, these systems, we, we might be actually doing is just sort of reinforcing mm. the the almost the underlying energetic right. uh, properties right. um, that will be just perpetuated in in a in different form. And so we have to practice differently, which means stepping back, as you said understanding the deep history of this. And, and I, I know sort of from the world of, of psychology, you know, and um, when it comes to behavior, a lot of trying to reprogram behavior is it's not saying I have to do this differently tomorrow. It's, it's saying that the first step is to recognize that I just did something that I didn't want to do. And then the next time, maybe it's recognizing it when you're in the minute, in the moment of actually doing it, it takes a while to get to a place where you can actually recognize it in advance. You know, so it's a, it's a process. Um, that's a hard thing to ask people to do, but it seems like that if we do have this moment of pause or reflection, the real hard work is to even go deeper than where people are taking it right now. Yeah. You know, I, I just, um, first of all, I think you're absolutely right. You know, I, I think that, that, that we, we need to take it much deeper. Um, and there are a lot of people who um, don't really know what that means in relation to them. And so one of the things that we also have to be aware of is, is the fact that uh, not everybody is starting from the same place in regard to, um, you know, time of day. Right? Mm-hmm. So if we think about the awakening in relation to time of day, uh, you know, I, I've been awake now for 23 hours, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and somebody else may have only been awake for five minutes. And so, uh, and then we, we span that awakening over 2000 years right, of history that we mm-hmm. um, that not everybody's, not everybody's operating at the same time of day. And we have to, you know, we have to really be aware of that and be compassionate to some degree with that and, um, and help them to recognize, you know, you just woke up. Let me explain what's going on. Uh, this is what I know up to this point. This person knows a little bit more and this mm-hmm. person a little bit more. Uh, there, uh, there are two points I want to make, but I, you know, just, just to give you an idea, there is somebody who I've been friends with since I was uh, 14 years old. Uh, and that was a few years ago. Um, you know, given that I'm now a grandmother mm-hmm. and, um, and, and, this person has never had to really contemplate their whiteness. Uh, And um, I was taken out of the school, the high school that I was in um, by my, my mother and my grandfather, because they would not allow native students to enter into any college prep courses because native native American students weren't smart enough to go to college. And so, um, and I was sent away to school. And if I were to sit with her today and ask her, why did I have to leave that school? Well, you know, your family didn't like the people you were hanging out with, or, uh, you know, uh, they didn't think that you were focusing enough on your studies. Uh, it just, it's not within her realm of reality that the reason why I left that school was because the principal of the school was such a racist that it was his policy that no native students were allowed to enter into any AP courses, period. Mm. Right. And so different times of day, you know, I've known this, this person for, like I said, 36 years, we've been friends. Um, but she just woke up a few minutes ago. Mm-hmm. Right. And so, uh, it doesn't make her a bad person. It just means that she has a lot of work to do to get to a place where she can contemplate at the level of depth that maybe you and I can start really thinking about some of these things. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, there's, there's two points that I wanted to make. One is that when we're thinking about um, 
this process of, of dismantling internalized oppression, decolonizing our hearts and minds. Uh, we have to recognize that, that what has been done to us has been this systemic deculturalization, right? Um, that our cultural ways of being and knowing, um, the process is to strip those away from us. Uh, and what people don't realize, because you ask somebody, what are American values? And they say, oh, liberty and freedom, baseball and apple pie, right? Mm -hmm. They really can't go any further than that. They really can't think about this this um, this value system other than in cliches. Um, because all of the values of those who have been uh, either forced to come here, uh, those who have been here since time immemorial, and all the others who have come willingly, uh, in order to be part of this melting pot, uh, they've actually stripped away their cultural values uh, and tried to fit into the American mainstream society, which is based on genocide and slavery and dominance and oppression, right? Mm -hmm. And so we have to recognize that deculturalization that has occurred within us and right that wrong before we can start addressing the systems that maintain those ways of being because we're going to bring the same values into the process, right? And so uh, if I look at what are my core cultural values as a Skijinue Apit, as an indigenous woman, uh, I have to look at uh, my relationships because for us, that's at the core. You know, Pasilda and Del Nabamuk, I recognize that I am, I am related to all life. Um, and, and from there, I begin to build a worldview that contains all of these values that are all defined in accordance with varying levels of relationship um, and cooperation and inclusion. And if we look at mainstream society, it's all uh, you know, competition, exclusion, right? Our value is not defined by who we include, but by who we're capable of excluding based on the status that we hold within our, this false hierarchy that's been created. Mm -hmm. and so we have to really look at that deculturalization and that stripping away of our core values and decide for ourselves, what values do we truly hold? And, you know, again, we go back into our cultural, our cultural traditions. Uh, you know, what were the traditions that we held at one time before they were stripped away? Uh, and, and go back as far as you need to, right? Uh, make assumptions. I assume that my uh, ancestors, you know, wherever you come from, um, lived in a better balanced relationship with the rest of creation. I believe that my ancestors, because I know enough to know that our humanoid species survived based on principles of community cooperation and collaboration, were more communal, cooperative, and collaborative. Right? And then look at the, the, what evolution has taught us. It doesn't favor any one species, right? I think that... Um, Barbara Marx Hubbard said this at one point in time that most brilliantly and concisely that um, what evolution favors is it favors uh, a purpose that is aligned with greater cooperation and higher levels of consciousness. And so it doesn't favor strength. It's not survival of the fittest. It's survival of the kindest, survival of the most cooperative. Uh, survival of those who are willing to evolve their consciousness to, towards a higher order, uh, you know, ordered state of being. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, when we, when we start to bring all of that into the mix and, and have that uh, really inform the way that we're thinking about our present moment, we see that we're just scratching the surface with a lot of the public discussions that we're having, that, that there is an opportunity here for us to go really, really, really deep. And it takes practice, right? Like you were saying, uh, you know, maybe the first time out, you don't do it. Maybe the second time out, you don't do it. Maybe the third time out, you don't do it. Uh, there was a friend of mine who sent me this thing that um, this, this um, spiritual teacher um, or motivational speaker um, once said, and he was talking about something that a woman had, had done in one of his classes. She wrote this on a, a they had them write down the five stages of life and growth, right? And she said, the first one was, I walked down the street, there was a big hole and I fell in it. Uh, step two, I walked down the street, there was a big hole, I saw it and I fell in it. <laughs> you know, the third day, there was a, a big hole, 
uh, I saw it. I, I tried to avoid it, but I still fell in it, right? And the first time it took me forever to get out. The second time I got out a little faster. The third time, yeah, I got out a little faster, you know. Maybe you learn to carry a rope with you, right? By mm -hmm. um, uh, step four, I walk down the street. There's a big hole. I walk around it. Uh, step five, I walk down a different street, mm -hmm. right? I mean, and this is the process that we're in the, in the midst of. We are, right now, we're using this, these same ideas and philosophies. We're walking down the street, and we're falling in the hole. We're walking down the street. We see the hole. We're falling in the hole, right? We walk down the street, we see the hole, we try to avoid the hole, we're falling in the hole. We have to be willing to walk down a different street. Um, we have to be willing to change the way that we're doing things to recreate a more aligned and humane and equitable and just set of values for ourselves and for all those around us. Um, and, uh, you know, really be willing to look at ourselves, no matter how woke we think we are, there's always work for us to do, you know, the uh, stay in your lane and cancel culture that I mentioned earlier, all of those things actually create more division between us um, than it does unify us, right? It doesn't amplify individual voices. All it does is it creates an echo chamber for one particular lane. And, um, you know, if we really want to be listening to one another, we have to be willing to open up the space for that listening to occur. And so, you know, there's, there's a lot of really incredibly deep work that needs to take place at this time. Mm -hmm. You said there are two things. I just want to make sure you, you covered them. Yeah, both. I wanted to talk about the deculturalization, um, to, yeah. that people really need to recognize that this whole process has stripped away our value systems and replaced them with the value systems of, of colonization and capitalism. Mm -hmm. um, and that if we want to be able to address it, we have to look at that deculturalization, no matter where we come from, um, and start to really think about what are my values beyond these values that have been imposed upon me. So that was mm -hmm. the first. Thing. Yeah. The second thing was the, you know, five steps walk. Let's right. get us on yeah. onto a different street. Yeah. It seems like um, some of this comes down to empathy and forgiveness on some level. Like there's a, there could be, you know, using that, that the metaphor of walking down the street, you could you could kick yourself, you know, for for making the mistake over and over again or whatever. And you could also, I think, for those of us who you talked about going deep into our history to to rediscover the values of our peoples, wherever we come from. That I think there are a lot of people that don't they don't feel a connection to that. They're not in the place that they're that that their people came from. They don't, they're not connected to that land. They're not necessarily connected to that culture. You know, maybe that culture has been, in a sense, gone for a long time. It had been replaced, you know, for a long time. And, and so not only is that a difficult journey to try to find that, you know, and I think this is where sometimes people try to appropriate other cultures that maybe it's a little bit more visible, you know, uh, because you feel like it's tangible. I can, I can hold on to that one. There's also just a lot of, I think pain in feeling that loss and maybe pain in saying that I've been part of this system that, and I don't even know necessarily how to think differently, you know, there's to recognize that is painful, you know, and I think, um, and so I think we have to actually have empathy for ourselves in that process. And then maybe that would help us have empathy for others who are not, you know, you talk about the, you know, the time of day, they're even further behind than us. Right. You know, um, the alarm's going off and they keep hitting snooze. Yeah. It does remind you of Groundhog Day a little bit. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you know, and trying to maintain that, that sense, sense of empathy, I think is, is really important. And I'm really glad you brought up sort of the cancel culture stuff because I do worry about that too a bit, which is, it's not to say that we need to, um, we need to tolerate, you know, some of the most oppressive and hate-filled and violent and dangerous, you know, no. uh, views in, in our country, in our no. society, but to, to shut down all views that are different than our own doesn't feel like it's going to get us where we need to go. Right. Yeah. I mean, and, and that, that exists between groups. There have been a number of times where I, 
I've been invited to speak with, um, you know, groups of uh, people from a number of different backgrounds, uh, supposedly representing a spectrum of diversity where members of other groups have really tried to shut down the voices of everyone else. So when we say, you know, we have this collective experience, uh, you know, uh, indigenous people and black people have very similar trajectories, even though we had different goals coming out of it. Um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, where people have been like, oh no, you can't mention black people at all, right? Oh, you, you know, you, you're not allowed to talk about uh, trans people at all. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, if you're not this, then you have no right to talk about how it might interface with what you're doing. How do we, how do we ever form unity? If even a basic saying, a sentence that uh, we have similar trajectories, you know, in regard to genocide and slavery, they both came out of the same history, the same papal bulls, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we have different tracks that we've followed going forward from those points of reference, but there were systemic things that were structurally done specifically to keep us divided. And we have to actually look at those things and we have to look at them together. And we have to be able to talk about how we've both been impacted. How have I been impacted by that? How have you been impacted by that? How has that impacted the way that we view one another, that we relate to one another, that we work with one another? How have our goals, um, you know, uh, shifted and, and our paths diverged from that point? Um, because I think that Black people have done a really good job of trying to um, fight their way into the system to find a place at the table, right? because that was their goal. They wanted an equitable place within the system. Uh, largely indigenous peoples have wanted to be left out of the system. We just wanna live our way of life. We want you to stop taking our land. We want you to stop condemning and outlawing our religion, our ways of being, our ways of knowing. Uh, we want you to stop taking our cultural ways of being and turning them into commodities. Um, and, and just let us be who we are who we are, and to live, uh, you know, what we here in our territory call Skidjuna with the Musawak in this, this indigenous way of life that um, is meaningful to us, which is most meaningful to us, right? And so uh, different goals, different paths, but still coming out of the same toxic soup, mm -hmm. right? Still being, still being impeded uh, in our progression along our collective paths, you know, that, that two row wampum, right? Like we're, we're traveling different paths, but they're parallel paths. And how do we look at honoring and respecting one another within those parallel lines and how do we reach across and work together so that we are empowering more people to actually join the movement because this this idea that oneness and sameness are equal hmm. is a huge obstacle to us you know and that's another thing that I talk about in the in my book is that you know oneness and sameness are not equal um, and so when we think about sameness and we want we only want to listen to people who are saying the same thing that we're saying right uh, we only want oneness to be achieved by people believing what we believe. That's not oneness, that's sameness. Right. And sameness is homogeneity. Homogeneity is the quickest way to kill a system. Right? Right. I mean, I just think about that with agriculture, monoculture, yeah. you know, what we're doing to biodiversity. It's, it's yeah. the same thing. Right? It's exactly the same thing. And so, you know, we have to be willing to look at that because, I mean, the whole concept of oneness is really about how do we transcend our differences Right? find the commonalities, those interest convergence points, um, benefit from the lessons that we've each learned, integrate the knowledge into the whole, and then all cycle forward together, mm -hmm. uh, allowing us to remain intact in the process. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not grist for the mill to be, to be ground down into uh, this one, you know, disgusting soup, right, inside this melting pot. Uh, we're, we're meant to move forward as a whole system intact, thriving with our biodiversity, um, uh, you know, undiminished. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, doing that requires us to actually show up and do, and do some work. And it's yes. not easy. So along those lines, uh, what would you say, someone listening to this conversation, you know, and I know that people are, you know, again, thinking about the hours of the day, you know, the time of day, people are in different places. So, um, but would you have a recommendation for folks who, who want to think about how they can use this moment of reflection to, to go deeper? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, really looking at and listening to um, the voices of those who are more knowledgeable 
Um, and maybe just, you know, starting out with a mantra, uh, there are people who exist who are more knowledgeable about some of this stuff than I am, right? Uh, mm-hmm. You know, I think that um, we've been taught to, that it's a sign of weakness to admit that we don't know something. Mm-hmm. It's actually one of the greatest signs of, of emotional intelligence and of spiritual intelligence that we have is to admit that we don't know something, to remain humble, to be open, to continue to learn. Um, I think that's, that's really important, but then to reach out to those who have uh, a different perspective, a set of, a set of um, uh, tools or uh, resources that maybe we don't have available to us because we haven't had the time or the inclination to develop them up to this point in our lives. Um, I think another thing for, for people who truly want to do something, who want to be a part of this awakening movement um, is to understand uh, uh, the difference between solidarity and support um, and, and to um, also think about, uh, you know, their notions of solidarity um, in relation to anti-oppression work, in, in relation to anti-racism work. Um, there are so many people who I know are really, really good people, some of them that I really care about, who are using this moment to really promote uh, an image of look how woke I am, hmm. right? There's a, a friend of mine who's got a huge platform and um, big, big um, social media following who um, posted a picture of herself holding, you know, uh, this, um, what are those? I can't think of the word. We'll just say holding a mic. Okay. okay. Um. And there were three black women standing behind her and she's a white woman. The symbolism of that is powerful, right? Mm -hmm. I'm so woke. I'm going to stand out here in front of these black women and I'm going to tell the world how it is, right? Um, From an anti-oppressive standpoint, right? Like really meaningful support for black, indigenous, or other people of color. um, It cannot be directed by white people. Mm -hmm. And so um, taking leadership roles within that movement means being humble, uh, honoring frontline voices, centering frontline voices, uh, recognizing that um, even if you think you can speak more eloquently than somebody who maybe is coming from a marginalized community, the importance of opening space for the pain-filled voice of that person to come forward is critical. Mm -hmm. It's critically important. And so, uh, you know, understanding that aspect of being involved in the work, I think, is really important. Um, and, and there are some incredible tools out there for people to utilize. And, and, you know, me and so many other people have a lot of information on our, on our various websites and Facebook pages and things. Um, but also to recognize the distinction between support and solidarity. And so uh, you can't claim to be in solidarity with somebody um, if, if that's something that you can, uh, you know, uh, pick up and put down at will, mm-hmm. right? Maybe you're supportive of it, but you're still operating from a place of privilege because, uh, you know, I have the privilege of being able to support you or not support you. Mm-hmm. I have the privilege of being able to show up or not show up because I'm not really being directly impacted. Right. Mm -hmm. And so uh, part of that process is really understanding that, uh, you know, bell hooks talked about this, that, you know, support can be given and taken away just as quickly, but Mm -hmm. solidarity is like real alignment with the interests and shared beliefs and goals. And I think that that part of that process, one of the things that I, um, that I teach about is, is about, uh, having, having white people understand the impacts on them. You know, there's, there's these five stages of impact, um, on white people in relation to the, the type of privilege that society has structured around them that actually impedes their growth and development as conscious beings. Um, it impedes their ability to have the type of world that they claim to want to live in. It impedes the creation of equity, you know, um, equity. It it impedes the creation of justice. Uh, Mm -hmm. It impedes harmonious balance because it's, it's systemically created to actually um, exclude all of those things that you're saying that you want to have included in a society that you want to live in. 
Mm-hmm. And so if you start looking at them socially, psychologically, emotionally, um, economically, right, um, in, in all of these different ways, you recognize that, oh, you know, I really do have interests. I have shared beliefs. I have shared goals here, um, which means that I need to stand in solidarity, um, which is a maintained ongoing commitment to my own development and in relation to the work that needs to be done out in the world. It's a two-part mm-hmm. process. You know, it's an internal and then manifesting that, that understanding into external action out in the world. Hmm. So. Yeah, it's a, it's a journey. It sounds like not a, not a, a quick solution. Let's, you know, go out in the street and show our solidarity by, by joining a protest, which is, I'm not painting that at all, but. That's supportive. Um, yeah. That's not solidarity. That's supportive. Right. And then I'm going to go home and I'm going to walk home. Right. Because it's a nice night out. We had this great action. Now I'm going to walk home uh, and I'm going to walk home and I'm going to walk home with the expectation that I'm not going to be violated on my way there. I'm going to walk home with the expectation that I I'm probably not going to get killed by the police between here and there. Right. Um, And, and recognizing that the simple things that you're doing, People of color have been killed for doing. Um, it was illegal for for me to speak my language or to practice my ceremonial ways of being um, until almost 1980, right? The American Indian Religious Freedom Act was passed in 1978, and then it had to go through that whole process. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, it was close to 1980 before it was no longer illegal for for my language to be spoken in the United States, uh, you know, and. In on Turtle Island, where the language originated, mm-hmm. and so you know, people just can't grasp that there's the state of privilege. But imagine what would happen if somebody came in from somewhere else and said, "You're no longer allowed to speak English. You have to now speak this language that you don't understand. We're going to punish you every time you don't do that." Right? Um, and and understanding the power that's in that language. Right. That's another thing when we when we think about the way that we frame things, the words that we use, uh, just as imp- important as the symbolism and the representation. Um, language of conquest, language that derived out of conquest, is structured in such a way to promote and to uphold conquest. Mm-hmm. And so, if you have a language that's been forced upon people, that has developed and grown and integrated as a result of conquest domination you know, colonization and all of the uh, nefarious practices that are associated with colonization, there's actually an inherent level of violence within that language that you're going to have to check yourself on when you're choosing your words. Mm -hmm. It's work, right? Yeah. You can do one thing. You can go out and you can pick up one book. You can talk to one person with the intent of understanding, not with the intent of communicating anything back, but just being really, truly receptive. Right. Yeah. There, you can do one thing and, and maybe you talk to one person and then you really, you know, like let that process through for several weeks or months or whatever. And, and then you take it a step further and say, okay, what are the questions that come out of this? Right. Mm-hmm. Um, you can start doing simple things. Like if we think about um, the colonization of our educational systems, who have that educational systems been, designed to support and what point of view have they been designed to uplift right um so uh when we think about when we think about education i think it's important to ask who developed the educational materials that that guided our learning um who was it that um whose point of view is being represented here who is who is uh represented in the images that we uphold as being admirable right? Mm -hmm. Um, What culture is dominant in the learning environment? One of the things that I think is just so profound is that people um, in this country seem to look at uh, having another language as being a deficit Hmm. rather than a a benefit, right? And so uh, if somebody comes to this country and they, they speak a different language, or if somebody is born in this country and they speak a different language than English, um, that's viewed within our educational systems as being a deficit. 
-hmm. And so uh, English as a second language students are put into a program that is viewed very similar to special ed within the educational system. Mm -hmm. And those students are automatically looked at as being deficient. That impacts the way that other students see them within the structure of society. They're automatically seeing those who don't speak the language of colonization as being deficient. And, and they so, can be internalized themselves, which is absolutely. even more damaging. Yeah. Right, right. And so, yeah, I mean, and that's part of the, that's part of that deculturalization, right, processes, learning to not be ashamed of ourselves, um, uh, learning to not look at ourselves and see ourselves as being deficient, um, you know, really taking, taking um, some responsibility for routing out all of these flawed and damaging perceptions that we've internalized and externalized. Uh, because there are a lot of people from different groups of, um, uh, you know, of color who actually look unfavorably on others from different backgrounds. Uh, there are, are, you know, people, for instance, from um, not very many, to be honest, but there are people um, who say, yeah, we really need to address this immigration problem. <laughs> mm -hmm. like, you know, these are your relatives. These are the people that you interacted with long before the colonizers came over here and, and changed the whole fabric of, of the Americas. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, there are people in the black population who are prejudiced against indigenous people. There are people in the indigenous population who, you know, uh, maybe they have religious beliefs that cause them to be, have biases against people who are from the LGBTQ community. And so there's all of this cross, um, you know, prejudice, mm -hmm. you know, because it's not all racism. Um, but there's, there's all of these beliefs that have been built into the structure that causes us to classify people according to the hierarchy of domination, mm -hmm. right? So that if you're, if you're a white male and you're educated and you're fertile, right, <laughs> and you're Christian, then you're on the top right uh if you're if you're not white if you're uh you know not christian if you're not straight if you're not educated you fall below the line right mm -hmm. uh and and we build these structures and these hierarchical systems within our mind that uphold the systems that have been created um by colonization domination oppression racism slavery you know, we're, we're, we're upholding the same systems that um, we claim to be fighting against by the ways that we think and, and engage one another. And so, um, you know, I just feel like I'm saying the same thing over and over again, but we, you know, we really have to be willing to dig down deep um, to look at that because we have to, we have to really think about uh, who benefits from the perpetuation of that culture, right? Who benefits from um, what's been established? Yeah, I think, and, um, and I would bring it back to economics a bit in the sense absolutely. that even if you change, let's say in that hierarchy yeah. that, that you talked about, and it's, you know, had been, it has been, you know, white Christian men. Right. And you flip that somehow, you right. know what I mean? But there's still a hierarchy and it comes down to people with wealth and property in a sense, right. you know, uh, yeah. uh, over everyone else and maybe you know, creating divisions among others is a way of, of making sure that collective power doesn't exist to, to change that dynamic. If you, you know, if you, if you change who's at the top of that, uh, but the system is still the same, you know, what have you, what have you really changed? Yeah. Yeah. And that's exactly what I was going to say at the end there. And there, there, are, there are four, um, four questions that people can, you know, ask themselves, you know, uh, you know, am I a colonizer? Let me find out, right? Hmm. Uh, am I, am I uh, an oppressor? Let me find out, right? Um, so look for hierarchical structures, you know, either in policy or even within your own mind that distribute power unequally uh, or unevenly. Um, you can look for um, policies that promote one point of view above all others or, you know, uh, at the exclusion of others that elevate human beings over other forms of life. Mm -hmm. you know anthropocentrism mm -hmm. um you know when you think that humans are the most important species uh, it's kind of like people who used to believe that the earth was the center of the universe and then they found out 
oh my God, it's, we're not the center of the universe. Uh, you know, and they, uh, condemned, uh, the discoverer of that, um, that very, uh, disappointing truth, uh, are you no, talking about Galileo? So, yeah, how yeah. long was how long was Galileo excommunicated? I mean, it was still like in our lifetime, right? That 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 was <laughs> that condemnation was taken away by the Catholic Church, right? Yeah. Um, and so, um, you know, the next step is for us to realize that we're not the center of creation as human beings, you know, mm-hmm. and, and and it's it's equally heretical to say that to some people today as yeah. it was for Galileo to say that you know, the earth was not the center of the universe. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, really looking at that, um, but also looking for um, paternalistic beliefs where you think, okay, I believe that this, this other group is deficient or somehow inferior to me um, because uh, they don't see things the way that I see things. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, it's, it's one of the things that I do is I do international indigenous rights work uh, oftentimes related to climate change um, adaptation. Mm -hmm. So when we're thinking about um, adaptation strategies for those who are on the front lines of climate change impacts, which are most often indigenous peoples, uh, one of the things that their first solution that's offered is let's move them into a market economy, right? Right. Uh, Let's start moving them into uh, our, our climate change adaptation um, suggestion is to move them away from the way of life that has been the only way of life that has preserved life on the planet into the way of life that's been destroying life on the planet. I mean, mm-hmm. it just like boggles the mind. And there's this paternalistic belief that you're somehow helping these people, right? right? Uh, those people who are inferior to you because they're not operating under the same strictures and according to the same hierarchy that you've established for how society is supposed to operate based on capitalistic. Right. Uh, colonial views, right? And so, like, you're really going to have to wrestle with that. Like, uh, how do we create dependency within the system? Move somebody to a market economy um, position, and they no longer know how to get their own food. Uh, they no longer how to take care of themselves. They no longer know how to live in relationship with the rest of life. It creates this dependency, but also it creates a sense of disempowerment within the individuals or groups so that they're more likely to fall under the power structure that's been so destructive, right? Right. There's this whole pathway. Um, And then looking for um, the ways that whatever policies, practices, beliefs that you hold, thoughts, ideologies, um, disproportionately harm or exclude certain populations of people. Um, So if you, you periodically ask yourself those questions, right, and you make those kinds of inquiries, then you can start to really explore and examine, is what I'm doing actually... Um, in alignment with the same patterns that have historically brought us to this place? Or am I beginning to move outside of those parameters into something that actually has the hope of creating something that is more equitable, more just, more humane, and more balanced, Mm -hmm. and uh, more in alignment with the values that I truly hold at the core of my being? You know, and I think that until we ask those questions, we're going to have a very difficult time moving forward. Yeah, I really appreciate this conversation. Um, I think there's a lot of takeaways for me, but one of them that I'm going to try to hold on to is um, that this is, it's transformative work that we're talking about and it is not going to be done overnight. It's a, there's a process of being patient and still persistent, right? So that's really important because when we, when we're talking about this, we have to remember that we want to be transformative. We don't want to be transactional. Right. And so all the work that we're going to be doing to move away from this colonial capitalist system has to be done outside of the transactional realm, in the transformative realm. So, you know, know, it's recognizing the system uh, and getting maybe more and more practiced at recognizing it in these moments Mm-hmm. Uh, and then trying to imagine something different and being maybe patient with ourselves yeah. for how challenging that is, because we, I mean, I'll speak for myself. I'm a product of these systems. And uh, to think that I can suddenly think outside of that, mm-hmm. you know, and practice that consistently, I think is unrealistic, you know, um, which is not to say we should be apathetic about it, but, but 
empathetic with ourselves and um and Absolutely. see this as a as a long game, not necessarily like a, yeah. know, a quick fix. I mean, the elders always tell us that too. Like this is, you know, it's cliched, but it's absolutely true. This is not a sprint. It's a marathon. The work that I'm doing um, in regard to working to create a more equitable, just, humane, compassionate and balanced society was work that my uh, 10th generation ancestors were doing, right? Mm -hmm. Um, But also, I don't know if you remember when we were together, one of the things that I I said was, um, you know, there was some real emotion in the room when we were talking about what our likely future, immediate future looked like. Mm -hmm. Um, And there were some, there were some men in the room, uh, you know, probably some of the women too, but, but specifically some men in the room who were taught to be part of this um, patriarchal system that views the offering of choice as weakness uh, that has trained them to be competitive rather than cooperative. Um, so that they just want to convince people that their idea is right and that's winning, right? Mm-hmm. And um, and who have been trained their whole lives for a world that is rapidly, you know, disappearing before their eyes. And so there's incredible pain in that, right? When we talk about trauma, um, we talk about a traumatic experience. A traumatic experience is something that puts us in uh, a position of either immediate or long-term destruction of of self in some way. Hmm. And so when we're looking at what we're asking people to do, it's traumatic for them because they're being asked to uh, look at everything that they've been trained to be, everything that they've been prepared to be, especially if they're like my age or older, right? Um, Hmm. So, you know, if they're in their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, um, if, if, if we look at, you know, all of the people who are in that age group, They've been trained their whole lives, moved into their careers, uh, been functioning in the world in a way that um, is not only becoming less relevant, but less accepted. Mm -hmm. That's traumatic. That's a, that's a a destruction and deconstruction of a self that they have spent decades building uh, an identity around. Mm -hmm. And we have to recognize and be compassionate with that process Um, and not just say, okay, boomer. Right. Right. Uh, These are people who have have been doing what they thought was the right thing. A lot of them, uh, because this is what society told them they were meant to become. This is how society told them they were supposed to behave. Mm -hmm. Uh, This is the role that they were supposed to be in, um, you know, in regard to their gender identity. Right. Uh, In regard to their socioeconomic status, in regard to their level of educational capacity. And so, you know, when we start looking at all of these things, uh, we can't move into any of this without some compassionate awareness of the trauma that's, uh, you know, inherent in the process of of that transformation. Yeah, and I think, I mean, not not necessarily people that were in the room with us, but I think there are many people in this country. I think if we don't, if we don't have empathy for that uh, and we just shut it down, I think you some people turn towards the kind of trumpian you know anti political correctness thing because they they feel like their identity is under attack and and um, it is. it is i mean right. let's be clear it is under attack and and empathetic and empathetic right. the fact that it is under attack right yeah. um but uh to have a kind of a quick dismissal okay boomer or get over it or whatever right. it is Right. You know, I think is not showing uh, it just just even from the standpoint of being successful and productive, you know, yeah. there might not be a winning strategy, you know, uh, to do that, yeah. though. I understand. I understand the motivation. You know, I do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and I understand also that there are a lot of people who have been shut down for a lot of years. You know, right. there are a lot of us who have had to spend, you know, all of our life and invest a lot of blood um, into this process of actually being heard, to be in a position uh, where their voices are heard. And, um, and, and you know, the pushback that's required, there's, it's like uh, in some of the trauma work that I, that I um, do, one of the things that I talk about is how when, when your voice has been oppressed or suppressed or repressed, 
mm-hmm. um, for a long, long, long time, it's very hard for you to speak your truth. And, uh, you know, there were, there were times in my life when I was working through my own trauma, um, where there were things that I wanted to say that I could literally feel them right here. Hmm. Like I could feel them bunching up right here and I was, ha- I'd have a hard time swallowing physically. Um, I felt like I was suffocating and they couldn't get out. Right. This is where the seat of our will is. It's right in this, this, this center here. And, um, and I needed to use an incredible amount of force eventually to get those things out. So when I first mm-hmm. started speaking, it came out with a lot of force and a lot of anger and a lot of mm-hmm. energy because the energy that was required to move past that blockage of the oppression, suppression, mm-hmm. and oppression of my voice, mm-hmm. um, uh, you know, was still that, that momentum of that was still coming forward. Mm-hmm. And then over time, it evened out, but it took a long time. And mm. so I also understand the force that we're feeling, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but we have to help people to understand that process because what they're hearing from others is, you know, you're just angry and you're flawed and you're, your 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 right? Instead mm-hmm. of, you know, I really understand this process because I did the same exact thing. And what I learned was this. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, is there... Uh, is there space within you to really think about, you know, how has my voice been repressed? How has my voice been oppressed or suppressed, right? Um, How have I been inhibited from feeling my own power? And how is that now coming into play in the way that I'm engaging the rest of the world? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and there are subtle ways to do that. You never start right in the fire, right? You start outside the fire and you slowly work your way in. And so there's an urgency to this time because people are like, we have this moment, we have to, you know, but like I said, my, you know, 10 times great grandparents are doing this work. And, you know, my 10 times great grandchildren will be doing this work uh, to some degree, right? Uh, Mm -hmm. But we have an obligation to move the work forward. Uh, and we can't do that unless unless we're really willing to look at all of the obstacles that are in front of our tires. Yeah, it's um, so bringing back to this idea of an unraveling, you know, uh, I think we're going to be in this for for a while and we have to be very mindful and actually soulful in thinking about what we're stitching back together uh, coming out of it. Well, I really appreciate this, Sherry. It was a uh, it was a lot of things I think that I'm going to be mulling over myself, and hopefully, folks who've been watching and listening um, have that as well. So, I really appreciate it. You know, I'm I'm mulling them over constantly myself, my yeah. friends. So, I you know, I think that we're all on this journey together, and uh, I thank you so much for holding the space for people to have these kinds of contemplations and for these discussions to happen because it's absolutely necessary. Thank you. 